Hello and welcome to all of you watching. I'm Julia Seeger and this is Tech24. In this edition, from Guatemala to Iceland and Reunion Island, several volcanoes have erupted in April, prompting us to question what kind of technology is now helping scientists monitor and predict their activity. Satellites, drones, but also artificial intelligence, volcanologists have a variety of high-tech tools at their disposal. And in Test24, we'll take a look at two flagship smartphones which are raising the bar, including the Oppo Find X3 Pro, which has possibly the best camera gimmick yet, a microscope. Now, in the last month or so, more than 20 volcanoes erupted across the world. As spectacular as an eruption can be, with lava roaring out of the ground, it can also be devastating for inhabitants living nearby. La Soufrière volcano on the Caribbean island of St. Vincent, for instance, recently awoke, prompting residents to evacuate. Several other volcanoes, however, are also being closely monitored. Catherine Bennett has more. Molten rock and ash spew 300 meters into the air from Iceland's Fagradalsfjall volcano, high enough that it's visible from the capital city Reykjavik. The flow is more powerful, the chunks are being thrown higher, and that means, as you saw just before, that it can start raining scalding hot ash. It's not particularly pleasant. The volcano's been erupting since March 19th and has been remarkably stable for most of that time. Now, though, activity has ticked up at one particular crater and is behaving almost like a geyser, something experts believe could be due to changes in the composition of magma and gas. To be steadily flowing and gushing for nearly two months, that's pretty unusual. Now it's starting to become more like what we know from elsewhere in Hawaii, Reunion Island and other similar places. Because it's so stable, tourists are able to get up close and personal. That's because its magma is quite liquid. The more viscous magma is, the greater the pressure as gases get trapped underneath. That's what causes powerful eruptions like this one from Indonesia's Mount Sinabung. It erupted on Friday the 7th of May, spewing a column of volcanic ash 2.8 kilometers into the air. Locals have been told to keep their distance for now, but it's being closely monitored. It's one of the most active volcanoes in the country and has forced some 30,000 people to leave their homes over the past few years. The Pacaya volcano in Guatemala is even more insidious. A lava flow is creeping slowly towards the villages surrounding the volcano, and residents wake up every morning, wondering if today will be the day they'll have to leave everything behind. Although there are indeed giveaway signs that a volcano is likely to erupt in the near future, like an uptick in seismic activity, accurately predicting an eruption is actually notoriously hard. Well, to talk more about it, let's bring in our tech editor, Peter O'Brien. Hello and welcome, Peter. Hi, Julia. So, Volcanoes are indeed hard to predict, one, because there no two volcanoes are going to behave the same way, and also because of the 1,500 or so active volcanoes out there, only a few are actually monitored today. Yeah, there's so many of them, and the problem is, right, most magma en that ends up in the Earth's crust never actually makes it to the surface. So you've got all of these volcanoes constantly burping and gargling and swelling, um, but the tricky thing is that no one measurement can tell you exactly when one is going to blow and why. You have to use a variety of different methods in tandem with each other to get more accurate readings. So, for instance, tilt monitoring and GPS can sit on a volcano or look at a volcano and see if its shape is changing due to the magma bulging within it. Um, seismic sensors, meanwhile, can monitor tremors in the earth that might suggest magma movement. And you can also analyze gas and groundwater from the volcano to see if its chemistry or if its temperature is changing, which might suggest that the ma magma is rising up. So those are the tried and tested methods. What about the cutting edge technology? So seismic tomography is only getting better and better, and that's using seismic waves to penetrate inside the volcano and visualize its kind of plumbing system to see where the magma lies. Satellites, meanwhile, measure changes in temperature, and they prove to be very promising and quite accurately estimate that 
if a volcano is going to get hotter, well, in a few years, it might explode. Scientists have even sniffed out a potential relationship between volcanoes and the moon. In just the same way as the moon pulls on the Earth's oceans, it also pulls on the crust. So if we look at changing tides, we might be able to predict whether a, a nearby volcano might erupt. But as I say, all of these data points are useful within themselves, but much more useful if you can use them together. So if we can pull all this data together from all of these different instruments and put them into, say, a um, AI software, which can work out and um, come up with patterns that humans can't predict themselves, then that might be much more useful than us trying to do it by eye. It's just incredible how much these high-tech devices are helping us better understand the planet on which we live on. Thank you very much, Peter, for that. We're now going to move on to a whole other chapter of the show. Her name is Nopurtiwari, and her application, Smashboard, has just received the UNESCO Net Expo Innovation Grand Prize. Smashboard is more than an app. It's a digital ally or a digital safe space where anyone can fight patriarchy. Well, joining me is the founder, Nopurtiwari. Thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Thank you, Julia, for having me. So tell us more about why you decided to launch this app and what it is that you offer on your social media network. Well, quite simply, I was seeing way too many women and people of non-normative genders facing some or the other kind of sexual and sexist violence or discrimination around me, both here in France and also in India. And even today, those who don't die of this violence lose many years of their lives to trauma and are not able to thrive to their full potential. So the idea was to build Smashboard, which to answer your uh, other part of the question is a unique global and hyper-local digital platform. It's a kind of alternative social network for uh, feminists that connects people fighting patriarchy. So uh, in creating this multitasking digital ally, we bring people, professionals, experts, survivors to create a kind of digital community uh, for people who are doing this labor of fighting patriarchy, which is so important both to bring relief and to find uh, long-term solutions. Now, you promote the concept of intersectional feminism. What does it mean exactly? Well, the idea of intersectionality was actually introduced by critical race theorist Kimberly Crenshaw in a paper in 1989. Uh, but to put it really simply, intersectionality is really about recognizing multiple oppressions that an individual has to face. And then, you know, uh, sort of like uh, outlining creating your activism around that. For instance, white women are insulated from racism that marginalizes black women and women of color like myself. And uh, just as there's white feminism here in the global north, there's upper caste feminism in parts of India, uh, in all of India actually, and parts of the global uh, south that excludes oppressed caste women. So I'm insulated from caste oppression, but not from racism. So basically what intersectionality does is that it, it outlines the fact that feminism isn't really a movement that belongs only to white women in France or to upper caste women in India. Uh, and that the people who are facing the maximum number of oppressions should really be at the center of what, whatever we are fighting for. That's basically what intersectionality is. Now, what role can social media platforms play in fighting injustice? Well, I would say that the digital, you know, the realm of the digital is no longer outside the realm of our lived experiences. In fact, it's become an integral part of it. And about a third of the world's population will be on social media by the end of this year. So if you look at what's happening in India right now. You know, Twitter has become a lifeline for people who have been literally abandoned by the government and failed by the poor medical infrastructures uh, right now in the middle of the pandemic. So people are connecting with each other all over India, finding, uh, you know, the resources, etc. So, uh, you know, when systemic problems cannot be resolved, uh, then people coming together can do a lot to bring immediate relief and uh, also lay the groundwork at the same time to sort of ask for reforms. Uh, so that's what the social media can do and much more. However, uh, patriarchal violence does get reinscribed in these uh, legacy media platforms, including Twitter. And we are hoping that uh, Smashboard in that sense will be different. No, Portiwari, thank you very much indeed for that. And we're going to move on now to Test 24.
We've got two new phones uh, here that continue to prove Chinese smartphone makers are raising the bar for all the rest. And we're going to start with Xiaomi Mi 11. Am I pronouncing the, the Xiaomi same? Mi 11, Julia. <laughs> and once again, a Chinese smartphone maker is stuffing flagship specs into a phone which costs way less than a normal flagship. So this is the Xiaomi Mi 11, and it has a 6.8 inch screen with 120 hertz refresh rate, 1440p um, resolution. It's got a Snapdragon 888 chip with 5G integrated, up to 12 gigabytes of RAM, up to 256 gigabytes of fast storage. And if you don't understand any of those figures, we'll just know it's very, very fast, very good looking, and has a good battery. And it comes in at just 750 euros, as opposed to something like a new Samsung or iPhone flagship, which will cost well over a thousand. Now I'm sure there's a downside to it. Well, I really have to just nitpick on this because in terms of value, it is very good if you want the highest end specs. I don't really like the camera bump. It sort of sticks up and you can't really put it nice and flat on the um, on a table. But in this camera bump, you have three exceptional cameras. So you've got a 108 megapixel standard camera. You've got a wide angle camera and a macro camera as well. But it's got nothing on this other phone I'm about to show you, which is the Find X3 Pro from Oppo. Now, this is another massive Chinese disruptor, and it's got very similar specs to the Mi 11, except it's got this nice curve back to it, which kind of covers, mm. covers over the camera bump a little bit. Um, it does come in at 1,150 euros, which right. is a lot more expensive. And what do you get for that? Well, you get probably one of the most ridiculous smartphone gimmicks I've ever seen. It's got a literal microscope in it. So this thing zooms up to 60 times and it even has a little light around the camera to illuminate the subject because you need to get so close to it. I played around and took some photos with it earlier. Can you guess and tell me what any of these are, Julia? Okay, I'd say lower left side, I'd say maybe a piece of fabric. Yeah, or... what piece of fabric? I'll give you a clue, what? they're all in the studio here. They're all here yep. in the studio? Yep. Oh, wow. This one on the bottom left here is my shirt. Oh, this one right. on the top left is. I was going to say some kind of membrane, cellular membrane or oh, something. Oh, on the top right, yeah, that is um, the microphone cover here. Wow. Um, top left, we've got um, the screens at the back, uh, on very close up, and this is my skin on my wrist. So that's really nice for everyone to see. Oh isn't wow! It? I was yeah. going to say tiles on the floor. Oh so really? That's oh, how far... scaly skin. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, Peter. Pleasure. It brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech Twenty Four. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.